वेलकम बैक टू द चैनल दिस इज ट्रेंडी स्टॉम एंड यू आर वाचिंग सेकंड पार्ट ऑफ व्हाट इफ नरूटो वाज रीएनिमेटेड विद शिनेगामीस पावर इफ यू एंजॉय दिस वीडियो प्लीज लाइक शेयर एंड सब्सक्राइब टू द चैनल नाउ वेस्टिंग नो टाइम लेट्स स्टार्ट द स्टोरी हिट्सुगाया टर्नड ओवर ऑन हिज साइड फॉर द एंथ टाइम दैट नाइट ही ओपेंड हिज आईज एंड लुक्ड एट द वॉल एंड द पिक्चर ऑन हिज नाइट स्टैंड व्हिच वाज लिट बाय द मून्स ब्राइट लाइट देयर वर बेटर थिंग्स ही कुड हैव डन विद हिज टाइम दैट नाइट But the thought of finding out tomorrow if his old friends were right and the village had changed its mind about him made him nervous. He rolled back over onto his back and let out a frustrated hiss. How come something that was always so simple for him was now so hard to find? He didn't want to think about other things while sitting here. He hasn't had the best time with that happening so far. He really wanted to do something, but he knew that trying to connect with Hirenmaru would only make him more antsy. No. What he had to do was pretty easy, even though every time he tried it, the same thing happened. He had to look into it, and he had to look into it more thoroughly. That meant breaking into the library, of course. Like one does. Hitsugaya took a moment to put on his shiakusho and hauri. He then took another moment to slowly take off his clothes. For example, if he was going to sneak around and break into libraries after they were closed, he should have been less obvious. Or at least not as easy to spot as himself. It's too bad that he wasn't a showy person in real life, and Hitsugaya's lip curled as he looked at the collection. He had, for lack of a better word, forgotten how bright his closet had been. Still, he was able to find some gray and black clothes that were pretty plain. Wore normal clothes, but he wouldn't stand out too much. He longed to return to Soul Society as soon as possible. He already missed Seiradi and the way things were there. He also missed not being constantly reminded of a life he would have rather not known about. He shook his head and clenched his teeth. No. That wasn't the time to be sad about it. Now was the time to find answers or at least learn more so that they could work from there. Hitsugaya cleaned out the closet and knocked something out of the back. It broke on the ground. Then he looked at it and all he could do was stare for a moment. A mask of a fox. Ha. Huh. He hadn't seen that since he was a child, having fun and pulling pranks in the middle of the night. He took a slow breath and closed his eyes. He felt conflicted for a moment as memories of being turned down and scolded harshly flashed before his eyes. He wondered why he had been treated that way. Hitsugaya let go of his riatsu just enough to chill the room. He was going to say that the summer was to blame for his lack of discipline. He put a shirt around Hirenmaru's hilt to make it look a little less recognizable. He had to because he couldn't leave Hirenmaru behind in this world if he wasn't sure where it was. Putting on the mask, he jumped out the window to the next roof over, his goal clear in his mind. Not letting people into the library was. It's so damn easy. Making sure that the city patrols didn't find him and his shunpo wasn't seen was a little annoying, but it was possible. A lot of years of practice and experience helped with that. The building was very quiet and the shelves were full of scrolls and books. But Hitsugaya was on a mission. He wanted to learn as much as he could from books that talked about the afterlife, chakra, and how to call on spirits. After looking at the archive list that showed where the materials he needed were kept, he went on what turned out to be the most frustrating scavenger hunt he could remember. The search results were not very good, which almost surprised him. Even though he read some interesting ideas about the afterlife, the texts he was looking for didn't seem to have most of the information he was looking for. He did read about a restricted archive, which is why he started looking for it. At least some of the layout of the village before it was destroyed came back to him, which helped him in his search. Hitsugaya finally found a clue in the form of a building carved into the face of a cliff that had the Hokage monument carved into it. He had searched most of the city, but only briefly. He stopped for a moment on the roof of a nearby building and looked up at the carving of the fourth Hokage. That meeting his father through a piece of chakra written into his seal would be the only time he'd ever see any part of his family. How sad would that have been? He turned away and kept walking forward, carefully going down the steps. He got away from a patrol by slipping under the stairs, but he thought that anyone who saw him would find it strange that he seemed to be standing on nothing. He got to the doors and read the writing above them once his way was clear. The Kenosha Archive Library. Good. He was in the right spot. And then he walked in. He carefully opened the door, being careful not to make it squeak. He walked slowly down to the main floor of the archives. As he looked around, he suddenly felt like he had done something very wrong. There were a lot of records. What was he going to do to get what he needed? 
he was not sure if they would even want it. Well. There was only one way to find out, and that wasn't to do nothing. And so Hitsugaya moved forward and started the hard work of figuring out how the archives were organized. He didn't want it to take so long, and there were too many close calls with blanket patrols, but he did find some interesting papers. He then looked at the table in the middle of everything. A few chairs were pushed up against it, but what was really strange were the books and scrolls that were lying on it. He took one out and looked at it. What chakra is all about? He then looked at another book with wide eyes. Documentation on the implicity of a next life. It was. Don't trust. A trick? Hitsugaya was on guard right away and cursed himself when he felt someone else in the room. I thought I'd find you here, Hitsugaya. Years of practice were the only reason he didn't jump when he was called on so quickly. Hitsugaya shook Kakashi. Sensei's hand and took the mask off his face. I should have expected you to stay one step ahead. You have always been able to do that, he said. With his hands in his pockets, Kakashi walked out into the moonlight. His eye told her all she needed to say about how amused he was, I thought you'd come looking for answers. That seems like something someone like you would do. I did say that if you needed anything, you'd find me. Hitsugaya muttered, I guess you did, and put his hands on the table. As Kakashi got closer, he picked up one of the books and looked it over. Then he took out a chakra paper. He cocked his head to the side and frowned thoughtfully. In fact, I've been wondering about your current problem, Kakashi said, putting it forward. Maybe, we can get some answers with a practical test. He thought of something that made sense. One idea that could be used as a base. There was no doubt in his mind that he and Kakashi had the same idea. Then he reached out and focused his Ryoku on the thing. They both jumped back a little as the paper started to break down, making a strange screeching sound as it twisted, tore, and shrunk into an unrecognizable mass. Hitsugaya threw the paper away out of fear, and it broke into a million pieces as it hit the ground. On the other hand, there was a small piece that wasn't changed in any way. That piece had a clean, even tear. Well, Kakashi said, it looks like one of my theories is right. Hitsugaya took a deep breath and looked down at his hands. Ryoku and Chakra don't work together, he said. Is that what's happening? I'm being disrupted by being here? What if he could not return? Kakashi said, but there's still Chakra in some parts of you. Hitsugaya looked again and saw that he was right. Even though he thought he had a good idea of one answer, he still had a lot more questions. It turns out that he had been quiet and thinking for longer than he thought because someone pressed a book and scrolled to his chest to wake him up. It's interesting that the scriptures talk about chakra theory in the afterlife. He grabbed them and looked down at them before turning his head to look at Kakashi. It's early morning, Hitsugaya. You should get some rest. And take those with you. Just. Bring them back when you're done. Hitsugaya said, yes. Thank you. These shouldn't take me long to read. He carefully touched the pages and then turned back to Kakashi. I. Think some rest would help, too. He heard something sail through the air as he turned to leave. It just clicked with him, and he looked to see the mask. Also, don't forget that here. It'd leave a trail. He felt like he was being teased for some reason. He left with a shunpo and went back to his apartment, where he finally fell asleep. Hitsugaya woke up earlier than he wanted to and didn't feel hardly rested at all. Still, being aware of even the smallest changes around him was hard. Wired into his bones through habit. His only desire was to sleep more, so he yawned and stood up. He then looked around the room. As the sunlight came into the room, it was very hot, and his nose turned up. He didn't think it was necessary to say again how much he hated summer. He reluctantly got out of bed, put his shiakusho together, and went to the bathroom to take another shower. Due to how hot it was today, he spent more time in the coldest water he could find and even lowered the temperature in the room with his riatsu. He almost forgot what was going on today for a moment because he was enjoying the comfort of the cold. After that, someone knocked on the door. Hitsugaya got out of the shower and tried hard to listen. Hitsugaya, Shikamaru's voice came through, and Hitsugaya had to strain to hear it. The memorial's starting soon. Whether or not you come, that's your own choice but. I suppose I thought you'd like the heads up. Hitsugaya didn't chat back. He wasn't sure what else to say, but for some reason, he was glad to get the notice. After some silence, he heard Shikamaru's footsteps fading from his apartment door. 
This meant that Shikamaru was leaving. Hitsugaya sighed and ran his hand through his hair. He then closed his eyes and rubbed his temples. After dying, it seemed like these last few days had been the most tiring of his life, and all he wanted to do was go back to how things were. This should have been kept closed like a can of worms. But still. He became too interested to stay calm. He quickly got dressed and then went back to the rooftops. He was surprised by how empty the streets and businesses really were. A group of people were all going to the cemetery, and the thought of them all going there together was morbid enough to interest him in what was going on. When Tsunade was dressed as the Hokage, she looked older. Speaking to the crowd, Tsunade said, Today, exactly five years ago, Uzumaki Naruto gave his life to win the battle that the Akatsuki fought inside our own walls. Her voice was solemn as she spoke. Hitsugaya hid in the trees because he was shocked by how many people were there and how empty the gathering felt. He was a fine young man that exemplified everything that a shinobi of Konoha should be. In his heart burned the will of fire and that will burns on in all of us. On this day, five years after losing him, we pay tribute to his memory and move onward. It was warm. The sun was beating down hard on them all, and Hitsugaya felt bad about being here again. He wondered what kept him watching as Tsunade put down the first flower and as all of his old friends did the same. He also wondered what kept him watching as people who had laughed at him in the past sobbed over how they had treated him at his grave. He didn't understand why he stuck around to watch Konohamaru sit there in silence, crying over the loss of someone he cared about. He promised to leave as soon as Aruka knelt down at his grave and laid a flower on it. Aruka's face showed a unique kind of pain that tore at Hitsugaya's chest, ripping open wounds he thought were healed. The longer Aruka stayed there, the more he lost himself in the memory of Hitsugaya's death, which was enough to break him. There were clouds moving in over the village of mourners, making the sky darker and the temperature drop. It was not possible for this to continue. He had something to say and wished that everything would end. This made him think of all the things he felt bad about when he remembered these things, which hurt. Why didn't he pay attention to what he said? Making your way to his grave? That was very sad. Not only morbid, but also masochistic. Still, he was there. What a jerk. That was all. Hitsugaya had to stop by. Being able to stay objective was already getting harder for him after seeing everyone he had died to protect give up in grief on that hot summer day. But when he finally tried to leave, he got stuck because the last person he thought he would see was walking toward his grave. When the hell did the case cages group get to the village? Gara, Konkuro, and Tamari all walked up to the grave, and Hitsugaya couldn't move for the first time in a long time. He felt guilty about it, so he had to sit there and watch it happen. It was too much. Even seeing Aruka had been too much for him to handle. But now seeing Gara leave a flower for him? Seeing Gara's face change in small ways to show sadness, seeing Gara cry over Hima. There was thunder in the clouds above. When Hitsugaya heard the sound, he looked up and was shocked to see that the weather had changed and it was so cool that he could see his breath. When the first snowflake fell, Hitsugaya felt bad that he hadn't seen it sooner. He was there. It had been a long time since he'd lost control of his emotions enough to change the weather. He didn't want to think about it right now. Gara looked up and then over to the line of trees. His eyes met Hitsugaya's, who had been thinking about something else. The Jinchuriki, whose hair was now white, stopped moving and his eyes went wide. He stood still and knew what was going on. At that point, he knew Gara knew who he was. He ran away. He ran like a coward, jumping to the roofs to get away from the horrible scene. He was stupid to think he could handle it and even more stupid to let his curiosity get the best of him. No sense at all. He had to be smarter than this, right? It looks like not. When he got back to his apartment, he went back to the shower right away. The cold water was turned up all the way, and he stood there in it. The flood soothed the burn from the summer that seemed to stay on his skin even though it started to snow outside. He leaned against the shower wall with both hands, shaking them against the tile. He bowed his head and tried to control his breathing. He stood there for a while, but he forgot how long. It didn't matter how long he stood there. He only knew that it took him longer than he'd like to calm down. He washed his sweaty uniform after getting out of the shower and putting on his usual shorts and tee. Shirt. This time, he could finally breathe without feeling like he was breathing in glass fragments. When the uniform was dry, he hung the haori up to dry. He grabbed the fabric tightly in his hands as he reminded himself of what was at stake. 
he had to return. He couldn't keep putting everyone around him in danger for no reason. A captain who doesn't have a seal. That could change things forever and hurt him in a way he could never forgive. To cut down on the work he'd have to do when he got back in touch with the Gote 13, he decided to make tea and start writing a report. It was something normal that had nothing to do with what he had seen and would take his mind off of it. He sat down with an inkwell, a scroll, and a brush, and he cut out neat pages that looked a lot like the reports he usually writes. Then someone knocked. He was so sick of being knocked on. It made Hitsugaya feel bad to talk to or be around other people after what he had seen. He bared his teeth as he got up and walked to the door. He threw open the door with a cold look on his face. Go away, I don't care what you want to. When he saw Gara standing there first, he froze up again, and the carefully chosen look on his face broke into a million pieces. He didn't really think about his old friends Konkuro and Tamari. Even though they only looked at each other for a second, Hitsugaya knew that he was in danger. Tamari and Konkuro both looked at Gara with shock as her face changed, showing sadness. Naruto, he whispered. It was like Hitsugaya couldn't find the strength to put up his walls and barriers. It was impossible for him to hide from Gara, the case cage, because she knew everything he had been through twice. His eyes and face were in pain. He replied, Gara, sounding sad and light. His face showed that he was upset. I'm so sorry. No. Gara replied with a firm shake of the head, I should be saying that. You didn't deserve to die. And if anyone did deserve to be brought back up. No. They were told in a firm voice by the captain, who moved forward and closed some of the space between them. No, it was right for you to come back. Gara, I failed to save you, and now I've only hurt you. I should have you. Your death wasn't your fault, Gara said in a stern voice. You did save me. You say you failed, but Elder Chio would not have helped me the way she did if you weren't there. That was your job. You make people better by changing them. It was like Hitsugaya couldn't find the right words to say. How could he tell Gara that the person she had grown to know as a friend was no longer there? Turned into him? All he could think about was how he couldn't be the person everyone wanted him to be here for the first time since he got here. Gara looked at him during the break. Gara knew those eyes. Sad. Locked up. He then spoke. You were by yourself again. For way too long. It hurt you so much. My friend, I know those eyes you have now. The outside of Hitsugaya cracked. That comfort from someone who knew what he had been through was so great that he couldn't even explain it after all this time. His eyes were shining brightly. He was having a terrible time keeping his cool. He moved forward because of the sand. He fell because he wasn't ready for it, and Gara closed the gap, making him look shocked. When arms wrapped around him, he was so shocked that he couldn't speak. When Gara gave him a firm hug, it shocked everyone just as much. The sand shield then rose up around them, which was a move he liked so much at the time that he couldn't say it. Hitsugaya was obliged to do it. He knew Gara wasn't used to being touched and that it was still something he wasn't sure about, so this move was a real show of concern and support. He shook, and as soon as the first tear came, they all came. His sadness and longing for home took over, and he couldn't stop. As his shoulders shook, his chest hurt, and his throat hurt, he clung like a child. Shame filled him. Gara held him with a firm, deliberate grip, even though she was still fuzzy and rusty. I didn't want to die, Hitsugaya said in a shaky voice. He had no idea where this was coming from. I know, and it's not your fault, Gara told her. No one is mad at you. You're back now. But I can't stay. Hitsugaya hissed and felt a chill go through him. The dead have no place among the living, I endanger people just by being here, I have to go back up. Is that truly a rule, in the land of the dead? Hitsugaya didn't know how to answer that easily. Gara didn't say anything and held Hitsugaya until Hitsugaya let go. I'm sorry, Hitsugaya said in a rough voice. I don't know what came over me. Gara turned his head to the side and looked a little confused by what he said. Your ability to be open with your emotions has been something that I have admired, for a long time. He said, I am not the person I used to be. If everyone knew what I've done, who I've become, they wouldn't look to me as the savior they held Naruto as. Despite everything you have been through, you are still you, Gara said. Would you tell me what has happened? Hitsugaya made a face. I haven't seen you in a very long time, Gara. 
A lot has happened. For me, I remembered this life from 5 years ago. That was after living as a spirit in a different afterlife for 125 years. There are so many things I want to say I don't know where to start. He took a deep breath and looked up at Gara. My name has been. Gara gave a quiet nod. I understand. Hitsugaya. San, your friends talked to me about it. I'm sorry about the slip. Up earlier. But. You can call me Toshiro. Gara looked at him and blinked. Hitsugaya couldn't help but soften his face when he saw Gara's small smile. Sure thing, Toshiro. Are you in control? Hitsugaya used his palms to wipe his eyes one last time. Yes. Thank you. He almost didn't believe it, but he felt better for the first time since getting involved in this mess again. He would have liked to feel better without having to cry, though. Having cried already made him feel silly. He didn't pay attention to the painful twist in his chest and finished calming down. Hitsugaya took a step back as the sand shield finally fell. It looked like Gara had his hands behind his back. With his finger on the door, Hitsugaya said, if it works for you, you can come in. Gara cocked his head. I would take you up on the invitation, Toshiro. Tamari and Konkuro were shocked when Gara used Hitsugaya's first name. The rest of the Konoha 11 were also shocked. Even more surprising was that Hitsugaya didn't seem to mind that it was being used. Hitsugaya took a step back and led everyone into the apartment. As the captain knelt down at the table with his report spread out, he said, I was just making some tea. It's still on the kettle, so I don't have anything ready as of yet. Everyone at the table watched Hitsugaya go back to his work with interest that was not very well hidden. After a short time, Konkuro leaned forward. He began with, So, Toshiro. The captain said, Hitsugaya, which made Konkuro blink. I have. Given Gara permission to use my first name. The two siblings looked at Gara with somber looks on their faces. Konkuro said, All right. I'm sorry. It's Hitsugaya then. Just what? Are you doing? It was paperwork, Hitsugaya said. Standard procedure will be to file an incident report upon regaining contact with Seiradii. Seiradii, Tamari said again with a frown. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes for a moment. Hitsugaya replied, I don't plan to talk at length about my afterlife. But I will tell you that I did not go to the same place where everyone else is going. It looked like the hand of the Shinigami in this world, but I can't remember it. That was taken care of by the purification process, and I don't really want to talk to the Shinigami of this world. You can do that? The two of them raised their eyebrows as Konkuro asked. Hitsugaya wrote the next line of text after finishing the first one. Sakura noticed that his handwriting was surprisingly neat. In theory, yes. For the reason that I am a Shinigami, I am the only one who can connect with these Shinigami. While I'm in this world, I don't want to take a chance on seeing what kind of creature the Shinigami really are because it's so different from the world I've lived in for so long. What is it like? Now, Ino asked as he leaned forward. The other world? Hitsugaya kept quiet. He finally said. Very different. Ninjutsu doesn't exist as we know it, beyond being a fictional invention. He laughed and twitched his lip. Comics and television and the likes. Television. Shino made a face. As in surveillance? Hey, Hitsugaya sighed. The world there is. Much more technologically advanced than this one, but the afterlife is the same as this one and not as advanced. But there are costs, like not having chakra or being able to use tenketsu gates. Kibi said, I don't think I'd want that kind of world. Hitsugaya sighed and shook his head. What? Because Kiba didn't like the idea of not knowing, she asked. Gara told Kiba quietly, they don't have Jinchuriki, which was what was bothering Hitsugaya. Kiba's face fell, and he looked at Hitsugaya and Gara with a guilty look on his face. Oh. Hitsugaya let out a sigh and set the brush down. With the sound of the kettle whistle, Hitsugaya stood up right away. Excuse me. He went to the stove and turned off the kettle. He let the tea steep while getting cups ready for everyone. Soon, everyone had a cup of tea. Hitsugaya was sitting down again and beginning to work on the papers while the tea steamed next to him. Gara finally said in a soft voice, I don't understand how you are happy to do paperwork. Hitsugaya laughed. I am not contented, actually, but it is a sense of normalcy after my current life was dragged out from under me. He turned his head away. The vice. 
Captain of my ship always skips work to get drunk and throw parties. She wanted to put her paperwork on our captain even back when I was just the third seat. That being said, since I'm now the captain, she can give me her paperwork. She tries to put her unfinished work in my stacks and hides it under the couch in our office. When I'm out in the real world for a long time, she sends me folders full of even more work. He rubbed his forehead. The things I do to ensure we don't get our division's funding cut. Gara made a face. Oh, paperwork. Indeed. Conqueror said, man, I can't believe she has her station. She's lazy. His face got softer. But I can count on her. And a lot stronger than everyone thinks. I'm sure she'll look out for me. She has always done that. Even when I didn't, he thought to himself as he remembered how stupid it was for him to try to throw off his station during the Kusaka incident. Then he must have hurt her a lot, but she stuck by him. Gara said in a soft voice, you care about her a lot. An admirable trait in a commanding officer. It was a quiet laugh, and Hitsugaya shut his eyes. You'll never hear me say it in front of her because she won't let me hear the end of it, but I do. I have a lot of faith in her because I care about her. She is the reason I turned into a Shinigami. He groaned. Only the fact that Hitsugaya was talking more about himself than he probably meant to was enough for the other eleven to keep quiet. I'm glad Gara was there at that time, because it gave me a chance to finally learn something about the Shinigami I used to know as a friend but never seemed to find. Still, he couldn't keep giving out information about himself without meaning to. It wasn't really Hitsugaya's thing to talk about himself a lot. Enough about me, Hitsugaya finally said as he sipped his tea. Tell me about your life. You've been K's cage for seven years? Six, Gara said, but almost seven. Over time, it has become easier to get the older council members to agree with the changes I've been trying to make, so good things have been happening a lot. Hitsugaya cocked his chin. We've been having some of the same ourselves, actually. A soon, the two started a surprisingly lively conversation about resource management and economic growth that left everyone in the room speechless. Shikamaru and Neji both looked like they were listening, picking up on hints of what Hitsugaya was saying while he was busy getting back in touch with the former Jinchuriki. Gara said with a vaguely annoyed tone in his voice as he sipped his tea, to be honest, it's pretty annoying when there's that one person who thinks they're above reporting the right way to use resources and leaves others in their department to guess what they might have done. Hitsugaya replied, much agreed, and served himself more. He had already filled out a few pages of his report at this point. He also could feel the heat coming back and itchy spots on his collar and cheeks. It was uncomfortable, so he let out some of his cold riatsu, which cooled the room down without realizing it. He didn't even notice that everyone in the room was shaking. Unfortunately, that happens back in Seiradii, which makes my job harder. A lot of other captains have said the same things, but Kuchiki runs a very tight ship and Zaraki. After shaking his head, he looked like he was going through a lot. It seems like Zaraki doesn't care. His vice. Captain and third seat probably worked miracles to get his paperwork done at all. Why does he have his position, then? Gara asked with interest. Hitsugaya let out a loud laugh. Because as he's an absolute monster when it comes to Kenjutsu, he said. And he left a trail of blood and death behind him before he killed his predecessor to become captain, much like the ten Kenpachi in the position before him. Gara raised an eyebrow, and Hitsugaya took a sip of his tea. Don't look at me that way. That's how things are. This is how the 11th division is set up, by combat to the death. Their relationship with the 4th has been tense because the 4th has to send their healers over all the time. I assume from the symbol on your Howry that you are captain of the 10th? Gara inquired. Correct. His cup was put down by Hitsugaya. Does your division have a specialty? No, Hitsugaya said. The only specialized divisions at this moment are the 2nd, 4th, 11th, and... He made a face. 12th. Gara made a face. You hesitated. Let us just say that there is no love lost between myself and the 12th division captain and leave it at that, Hitsugaya said firmly. Gara gave a nod. Very well. Then he sighed and looked out the window. I think we should leave. It's getting late, and I don't want my group to panic enough that they have to send out a search party without me. It was then that Hitsugaya looked up at the clock in the room. What did he do to lose track of time so quickly? Yes, of course. It really is late now, as you said. I'm sorry I kept you waiting. Gara told her, no, you don't need to say sorry. 
It has been nice to speak to you again, Toshiro. Hitsugaya put down his cup and said, and you too. When they were done with their tea, the other ninjas stood up too. Hitsugaya noticed that they had all been surprisingly quiet while he and Gara were talking. They finally realized that they were trying to find out anything about him. Part of him felt bad for keeping so much from them, but another part knew how much he'd really told them and cursed Gara for being so trusting. But they did understand each other. The most important thing was that they had both lived like Jinchuriki. Hitsugaya, thanks for the tea, Tamari said as she stood up. Konkuro wiped his knees clean. Yes, I think it was a pretty good mix. But I would have liked it sweeter. He replied, the only sweets I like are watermelon and ama. Nato. Here, allow me to walk you out. The ice field. Hitusgai looked around as he walked through it, his brow furrowing as he did so. The rough ground under him scratched his sandals, and he tripped once, just barely avoiding a fall. Why did this take so long? What was going on? Where did he come from? He finally stopped being able to walk. He lost his balance and fell forward, but as he hit the ground, he felt the comforting chill of a familiar body supporting him. He took slow, deep breaths and closed his eyes. Hi Rinmaru. The dragon let out a soft rumble, and its tail curled around the Shinigami to protect it. Its wings closed around the two of them. Master, Hirenmaru said, his voice a low, reassuring rumble that hit Hitsugaya's body. He lay back, his eyes still closed. Hitsugaya said, I couldn't feel you, as he ran his hand over the ice. His voice was rough. I couldn't get in touch with you because you were gone. Making a Senkaimon was hard for me. I've been locked up. Just as you thought, the summon that brought you here messed up our connection and you, Hirenmaru said in a serious tone. I think you've figured out that the living and the dead don't get along well with each other. As if that wasn't bad enough, someone else's will try to make us both give in. I stopped it from happening because I will not let you give in to such a violation. But it hurt me, and I needed to rest. It also hurt your powers. It was a dragon growl. And that beast has been even more disruptive, taking advantage of the summoning and wounding me in a more literal sense. He replied, of course, but his eyes were tired. I should have guessed. I have been resting, Hirenmaru said as he curled around Hitsugaya and let out a low rumble. Hitsugaya opened his eyes and looked at the dragon's icy flank, where the wounds were still healing. He felt a sharp, hot spike of anger. How could he have let Hirenmaru get hurt so badly? Even so, the constant talking took his attention away from his inner monologue. Getting better and getting ready to help you with my strength. Instead of looking for a way out so quickly, you should have been resting. Hitsugaya was made fun of in a subtle way, which made him feel bad. He folded his arms and turned his back on the dragon. Ia. Master, we are one thing. I already know what you're going to say. Then why prompt me to explain? Hitsugaya asked with a raised eyebrow. To keep you thinking and alert, Hirenmaru said as he flapped his wings. You are trying to run. Oh. He didn't want to talk about this even a little. No. Hitsugaya replied with a squint, if you know what I'm going to say, then you should know that I was going to say that I'm trying to go back to my post. He didn't like what Hirenmaru was implying here. Hitsugaya felt very small and unimportant as Hirenmaru's red eyes looked right into his. Master, you're telling yourself lies. You shouldn't do that all the time, and I hope you're not starting to make it a habit. Hitsugaya gave Hirenmaru a mean look. This didn't bother Hirenmaru at all, and he gently rubbed Hitsugaya on the shoulder with his nose. Hitsugaya finally gave up and put himself back against the ice dragon to rest. He enjoyed the coolness of the ice. Master, the calling. Did something to you. Before, your form didn't have any chakra, but when it brought you back, it tied you to this plane by making chakra start to build up inside you. What? Hitsugaya took a sharp seat and asked. He put his hand over the seal on his stomach. The sage Hirenmaru said, no, it is not the beast's chakra. Though the chakra that brought you here was the of one who summoned you, it has been. It was, metabolized, Hitsugaya realized. In a way, yes. The Hirenmaru looked up at the sky. The skies here have had a breeze, more so than normal. He, too, looked up, and what the dragon said made sense. It's mine now. That's why the newspaper. He combed his hair with his hand. I have something I should have lost when I died and went to Soul Society. 
What does it mean for us? After a while, Hitsugaya asked. As the dragon sat back down on the cold ground, he let out another low grumble. I know as much as you do on the matter, master. Hitsugaya closed his eyes and sighed, which is to say not much. But thank you, for keeping me updated on your insight, Hirinmaru. Hirinmaru told Hitsugaya, you must be careful. Hitsugaya opened his eyes again and was shocked by how serious Hirinmaru's voice looked. This world is making you feel dark, and I worry about your peace of mind. Given how long it's been since he last woke up, I fear it will be bad for you that the beast is getting stronger. Hitsugaya's eyes flew open, and the last thing he remembered were Hirinmaru's words as they said goodbye. He moved around, tired and dizzy from the heat, but his eyes were fixed on the completely frozen ceiling. Where did he come from? The last thing he could think of was offering to lead everyone out. He looked to the side and was confused to see Sakura and Sai both leaning against his bed. They were both shivering and wrapped in blankets, and their breaths came in short bursts. When he saw this, he cursed and pulled his Ryoku in, moving it to coil under his skin in a cooling current. As his Ryatsu decreased, the ice around them began to melt. Also, Sakura's eyes flew open, and she blinked tiredly. The tips of her eyelashes were frosty. Naruto, she finally said, you're awake. Hitsugaya, he made a tired noise. What happened? Sakura said in a soft voice, you look like you passed out from the heat last night. Hitsugaya made a face as the towel was pulled off his forehead. We stayed behind to watch out for you. It's your Ryoku, right? Everything in the room was frozen. He made a low groan sound. Fuck it. I hate summer. As he sat up and scrubbed his face, he shuffled. He felt stiff and sweaty. I finally made contact with Hirinmaru again. Is that what? This was? Sakura asked with care. That was all Hitsugaya could say. No. I have never talked to him like this before. He made a face. I'm not sure how to explain it. Whatever brought me here messed me up. My abilities and link to the afterlife have been cut off, which is why it's acting this way. Kabuto's Edo Tensai, Sakura said softly. Hitsugaya gave her a mean look. What? Edo Tensai, Sai said again and again. That's what he used to get you here. He had some of your dead skin and hair with him. He felt really sick when he thought about that. He could bring you back from the afterlife by giving up a human life. The body of the sacrifice for your body, and the soul of the sacrifice for your soul. Sakura looked at her knees and wrung her hands. He bragged that he would control you and that we would have to fight you. That he would finally get the Kyubi and start the war they talked about years ago. This wasn't what he thought he would hear. It wasn't right. He tried to trap me in a body? That was bad, that was bad. But it did not work. The body that was coming together froze. It froze and broke, and then you were there in the pieces. So that was the summons that Hirinmaru was talking about, the one that messed with me, Hitsugaya stated slowly. But for it to reach all the way to Seiradi, that wasn't bad enough already. There was a scary, unnatural roar that filled the room. Hitsugaya jumped right up, but Sakura and Sai both stopped moving. Hollow. It was just another day to begin with. Matsumoto was drunk when he got to work. Her lack of attention got her in trouble with Hitsugaya. Matsumoto tried to come up with a reason to take a break. Hitsugaya got around that by telling her she would take her sake stashes if she didn't do at least some of her damn paperwork. Matsumoto only got a small amount of work done before she and Hitsugaya had to go watch their team's train in the morning. Hitsugaya got reports from patrols that were set up in the living world. That's why it was a pretty average start. After the horrible battles and wars they had just been through, it was nice to go back to their normal, unhindered lives. This was true even though cleaning up and rebuilding Seiradi was still going strong. Hitsugaya brewed some tea and sent in more reports. Matsumoto then began to fall asleep. Hitsugaya yelled, Oi! And woke Matsumoto up from her almost. Sleep. Enough lazing around, Matsumoto. With a yelp, she jumped up and put her hands on her chest. Oh, Taiko, I hate it when you do that. They almost popped out again. He poked Hitsugaya in the brow. He muttered, really? After everything that's happened, you'd think you would. 
He then started to mutter things that Matsumoto, if she paid attention, would understand to be insulting about her work ethic, or lack thereof. She made a face. Really, Taiko, she said with a sigh, you need to relax a little. It's been five years and nothing's come up since. Have you even gone to the bathhouse to get a nice soak and massage? He asked with a squint, after the last time? I would need to possess a death. Wish for my reputation to re. Enact the absolute humiliation of our last visit that, need I remind you, you dragged me into. Ah, Taiko, it was an honest mistake on their part, I'm sure. Hitsugaya moaned as he stood up and walked around the desk to get a stack of finished papers. Since you're so intent on slacking off, he began, then you can take this stack of completed paperwork to the first. He stood still. Taiko? Matsumoto asked. As she looked up sharply, she got the sudden feeling that something was wrong. It was all Hitsugaya could do to just stand there, his eyes wide and his face almost confused. He took a soft breath out, and then something that looked like ash quickly rose from his feet to cover his whole body. It was a shock for Matsumoto to get up. Taiko. He had sudden changes in his Ryatsu, going from high to low and almost dangerously falling. He could not see as a strange energy filled the air. Matsumoto was frozen in place, taken aback by how strange it all was. There was something different about it that made it feel like it didn't belong there. It seemed strange. Still alive. The paperwork fell to the ground as the rest of his body was covered in ash. In an instant, the ash was gone. Hitsugaya was not there. After that, Matsumoto was stuck and couldn't move. She did not move and just stared at the spot where her captain had been standing moments before. She couldn't do anything but stare because the disappearance was so sudden, strange, and hard to explain. It was then instinct took over. She was sure that things would get worse if she got sick from this pathogen. This information had to be shared right away. She didn't know what the disappearance meant, but she did the only thing she could think of at the time. She ran all the way to the top. In a short time, an emergency meeting of captains was called. As more captains came in, they were all tense because it had been so long since an emergency meeting. Strange, Rose said quietly as she looked down the line of captains who were gathered. How after a relative period of radio silence, we've been called to an unscheduled meeting with such urgency. Indeed, Lisa said, looking at the post next to her with narrowed eyes. Since she became a captain again in the Gote 13, Hitsugaya was known for being one of the most punctual captains. She was also sure she couldn't feel his Ryatsu, which was probably another thing that made the other captains nervous. They wouldn't have called us if it wasn't important to talk about in person, Kensai said, folding his arms. We'll find out soon enough. Zaraki, who came in second to last just to throw people off, and Miyuri, who did whatever he pleased, were among the last to arrive. As Miyuri walked in, he tapped his chin and said, Oh. Is Hitsugaya late? That's very strange of him. But I do have to ask. He took his place and looked at the empty spot with great care. What could possibly have happened to warrant an emergency meeting like this? Kiraku put his head down. He turned to Matsumoto, who had moved away from the wall and knelt at the end of the line. Matsumoto is actually the person we're all here to talk about. She spoke in a shaky voice and said, Taiko disappeared just ten minutes ago. Byakuya slowly opened his eyes to look at her and asked, disappeared? Before Suifang took a step forward, the other captains all kept quiet about the vice. Captain. Have we arranged a search yet? Tracked his Ryatsu? Matsumoto put her head down. He didn't desert his post. He vanished right before my eyes, in the office. Into nothing. Mayuri was clearly interested because he smiled almost all the way around. Vanished into nothing, you say? How fascinating. Izan put her hand to her mouth. Fascinating? That's disturbing. There was a thin line between Shinji's lips as he looked over at Matsumoto, who had stood up from where she was kneeling with a raised eyebrow. How did he disappear? A tight grip was put on Matsumoto's hands. One moment, we were just talking, and then he was almost engulfed in this strange ash. And I could sense this feeling in the air, an energy I've never felt before. Miyuri kept his grin on his face and leaned forward while he pressed his fingers together. This looks like a situation wherein my expertise is necessary. The edges of Kiraku's lips moved in a tired grin. Then you'll be glad to hear that you'll be in charge of looking into what happened when he went missing, the head captain said. And I've called in Yurahara Kazuki to assist you. 
Miyuri's happy interest quickly turned to irritation. He said, oh, now why did you have to do that? I could have handled this well on my own without that unpleasant man butting into my work. The disappearance of a captain, Iba said with force, is not something that can be spared any expense. Lisa said in a calm voice, Iba. Taiko is right. Matsumoto looked at Kiraku, who smiled at her to make her feel better. Don't worry. We'll find him. Matsumoto's first stop after being given permission to do a small investigation in the human realm was Karakura town. She sent the rest of her patrol to spread out in Japan. It was late at night when she got to town, so she went to the rooftops and tried hard to feel Hitsugaya's mei. She still didn't have anything, though, and it made her feel empty inside. Oi! Rangaku? What are you doing all the way out here? While on her one track search, Matsumoto stopped when she saw the other Shinigami standing on a different roof far away. When Ichigo saw her, he looked very confused. She went over, her face still filled with worry. She asked, have you seen Taiko? Her heart sank when she saw that the question was still making him look confused. I truthfully I didn't think you had, but I thought I should ask. Where is Toshiro? Ichigo asked, looking around in shock. Matsumoto said, yes. She rubbed her arm and said, Urahara and Kuratsuchi. Taiko are both looking into what happened with him. I've been told not to go into the office until they can discern if the disappearance had a pathogenic origin or if something else happened. Ichigo made a face. Shit, he growled and rubbed his neck. It was at least comforting to know that Ichigo cared when he looked up at Matsumoto and said, I'll be sure to keep an eye out for anything that could point us in the right direction. If you find any sign of him, let me know and I'll drop everything to help. Matsumoto gave a sad smile. Thank you, Ichigo. I. I'm going to continue to look for him. Ichiro looked around the city and then back at Matsumoto. Want some company on your search? Having company sounded good. It turned out that having someone to talk to was just what she needed, even though the search didn't lead anywhere. A week went by. Hitsugaya has not been seen or heard from for seven long, stressful, painful days. It felt like time went on longer than it had in the five years before. Matsumoto worked non-stop to help with the search and keep her own division calm. Lots of people in the division were afraid that Hitsugaya might have left his post again, like the time he did it before when he went after Kusaka. But this was different, and they knew it deep down. The disappearance of Hitsugaya was a mystery. Seireidi as a whole was very alert. After that, another emergency meeting was called. The fact that both captains and vice captains had to show up was enough to start a rumor mill and make people nervous at the meeting. It took Rukia a moment to look at both Renji and Matsumoto. She felt sorry for Matsumoto because, like her, she was standing alone without a captain to support her. The most recent patrol looking for Hitsugaya. Taiko came back from the living world, Kira said quietly, looking away from his captain for a moment as he talked to Matsumoto and Hinamori. Nothing was found. Hinamori twiddled her fingers nervously, and it was clear that she was sad and worried. This isn't like him at all. What if what if? Don't worry about it, Hinamori, Shinji told him with a wave of his hand. We've probably got news from Kazuki. TCH, Miyuri snapped, looking very angry as he and Urahara walked into the hall. Discounting me, are you? How ungrateful. Urahara said with a lazy smile, there's no need to make such a fuss, Kuritsuchi. He waved his fan as the two of them stopped at the end of the line and stood in front of the crowd. Kiraku's face looked strangely serious, which made the mood worse. But. He slammed his fan shut. We do indeed come with some interesting results to our investigation. I said, yes, yes, and Miyuri looked back at me. Namori Hachigo. Yes, Miyuri. Sama. Namori walked into the room, but her short height made her look out of place. Miyuri sighed and rubbed his temple. Bring in the projection. And do keep your voice down. She put a small cube on the ground and said, I'm sorry, Miyuri. Sama. The cube opened up to show a circular holographic projector with a dim node. And? Zaraki asked with a raised eyebrow and a look that didn't seem very impressed. What's this fancy light show and what's it merit all of us getting down here? Hold on, you jerk, Miyuri yelled. Urahara said, it's a map. His voice was strangely happy for how tense the room was. 
it's the culmination of what we've been working on. As Mayuri waved her hand over the map, she said, this is probably going to go over your heads, but we mostly keep the balance and flow of souls in the living world. That does not mean that we exist in an isolated instance. Our dimension is not singular. The fundamental principle of gravity, which establishes our perception of time and space, is absolute not just in our dimension but in others that run parallel to the living world, and we do have the requisite technology to access them through a senkaimon were they to be properly calibrated. Urahara gave a weak smile. That is, to say, that we can travel to other worlds. Or, rather, different instances of the world we know, that have divergent paths than this one. We began to experiment with this theory after tracing the origin of the energy residues that remained in Hitsugaya's office and, with meticulous work, sent forward a probe to investigate the energy signature of that dimension. Mayuri pointed to the blip on the map. And we found traces of energy which suggest to us that Hitsugaya is indeed currently in a dimension separate from the one we govern. Matsumoto sagged with happiness. It was news about where Hitsugaya was, and she would take it. Kensai's lip turned up. So the question is how did he get there? Oh, but that's not the question, Mayuri said with a sneer and a shake of the head. Don't be so simple. Minded. The real question is how did Hitsugaya get here? Pardon? Naneo asked from where she was standing, with a worried look on her face. His Ryatsu signature, said Urahara, has changed. It is larger than Kuritsuchi's prior readings in fact, it is comparatively astronomical and has a partial match to the quality of the predominant energy readings in that dimension, which is why pinpointing an accurate location has been so difficult. Mayuri hummed and tapped his long nail against his arm. Such a change could only mean that Hitsugaya was never from the living world we watch over in the first place. Everyone in the room was quiet for a moment as they thought about what that information meant. How did he get that much power in such a short time? Byakuya asked in a low voice as he looked closely at the two scientists. Oh, the power isn't him, Mayuri said with a wink. Not completely. It may be tied to his Ryatsu reading but it does not match his Ryatsu. There's something tied to him that has surfaced in this dimension, and I do intend to find out what it is. Still. The growth of both the new reading and his own Ryatsu signature are growing at what could be an unprecedented rate. Mayuri squinted at the blip, his expression introspective. The dimension where his most recent signature has been locked onto has also shown some strange fluctuations. It was clear that Izan was nervous as she asked, fluctuations? Time dilation is the easiest way to explain it, said Urahara. Though not time dilation in a traditional sense. It appears as if the dilation may be a consequence of the spatiotemporal displacement of a large quantity of energy, disbalancing the dimension itself. Though, that's just a theory. Iba made a face. Do you believe Hitsugaya is involved in the phenomenon? Believe? Do I believe? That's crazy. Mayuri laughed. I believe that if we establish contact with him he will give us exactly the information we need to prove that he was the cause of the time dilation in this other world. When Matsumoto opened her mouth to talk, a noisy sound stopped her. As the mark moved around, the blip on the map started to pulse. Mayuri and Urahara both looked at the screen very closely as it seemed to zoom in and a rough location started to show up. Oh, that's interesting, Mayuri said, looking overjoyed. Hitsugaya's Ryatsu has spiked enough for the probe to create a rough estimation of his current location. How? Suifang asked, looking at the device with curiosity. Ah, it's akin to a type of resonance imaging, Urahara said. His Ryatsu spike is substantial, to say the least. It's enough at the moment to rebound to our probe. Kuritsuchi gushed as he got closer, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I'll have new data to analyze for months at least. Renji moved his lip. So what does that mean for us? That means, Urahara said in a low voice, looking from Renji to Kiraku, we can quickly get enough information to figure out where he is. Kiraku closed his eye, nodded, and then fixed his determined gaze on Matsumoto, who turned around to look at him. Matsumoto. Hitsugaya is your captain and you're the last one who saw him, so this is your mission. Locate Hitsugaya and establish a point of contact with us. Choose your team and move out. Matsumoto nodded, and her face turned serious. Yes, sir. Hitsugaya was still alive, and she was going to find him and bring him home, even if it meant she would die, hollow. Before she saw what was making the bad energy in the air, Sakura could feel it. 
Hitsugaya cursed and looked down at himself as the pressure seemed to rise by the second. The PJs? Are you sure? Why did they bother to change him? He had the chance to put on his Shiakusho, so why didn't he? For the first time, he wished he had a Gigai that he could take off any time and still be dressed like a Shinigami. He didn't really want to fight in his pajamas, but he didn't have much time or choice. Hitsugaya quickly picked up Hiranmaru from where it was lying on the dresser and put the strap around his shoulder. He threw open the window and jumped out, even though Sakura was calling for him to wait. He quickly made it to the roof, where he was shocked to see that all of his old friends were also there, staring up at the horrible scene above them. What? What are those? Tenten asked with wide eyes. Hitsugaya finally looked up, and his eyes got even bigger. The sheer number of hollow coming in was easily one of the highest he'd ever seen in his time as a captain. It wouldn't be hard to cut them down, but it would be annoying if they couldn't get to the village below, which was quickly becoming a panic mess. Damn it, he growled and drew his Zanpakuto. He looked at the people behind him. You don't know how to deal with hollows. I've trained for this. Go into the village and tell all the shinobi you see to stay out of my way. Then get the civilians out of there. You're not going to fight all those things by yourself? Ino let out a gasp of surprise. He showed his teeth, Hitsugaya. I beat pain by myself. Do it now. After that, he jumped into the air and quickly closed the gap with Shunpo. You died. He was called after by Sakura. Hitsugaya chose to ignore the reply. They had to be here because of him. Since he had never been attacked by a hollow before and everyone in the village could see them, it was exactly what he thought it would be. Even though he was trying to stay out of sight while trying to get back, his presence here put everyone in danger. So, if they came to see him, he would give them everything they wanted. He growled, Soden Nizase, Hiranmaru. There was no longer any worry about what his power would do to this world now that he was one with Hiranmaru again. His power was fully used. As far as the eye could see, clouds filled the sky, making it dark. Thunder cracked loudly through the sky, lighting up the darkness. His Riatsu was so strong that it filled the air around him with a cold, biting pressure. A white glow wrapped around his body, making him look almost ethereal. At first, it snowed very hard, and everyone in the village was amazed at how powerful it was. This. Shikamaru took a breath, and Neji and Hanada both watched as Byakugan moved. Neji told him, he did this. The amount of power that man has flowing through that blade, Hanada took a deep breath. I've never seen anything like this before. Hitsugaya swung his sword into the air. Ice cracked along the length of the steel, and the dragon flew off into the sky. It let out a strange scream and then broke into five heads that hit the coming crowd. The hollows froze and broke apart into a mist of ice. Hitsugaya jumped into the fight, and the dragons did what he said. He moved quickly and smoothly, gouging holes in the masks of any hollow that was stupid enough to come close to him. With one stroke of his Zanpakuto, he would freeze them. At last. As they fought together, he could feel Hiranmaru's spirit humming next to him. They easily got rid of the threat. He was overcome with emotion, and he felt a strange sense of freedom and elation at being able to let loose, even though the fight would be way too short. A snake hollow tried to hit him, but he moved the blade forward and blocked it. Then, he beat the snake's fight and cut off its head. But it looked like the hollow understood too. A few people started to break away from the group. Hitsugaya growled and sent off a few more ice dragons to stop them. I won't let you. When he snapped, he fell on the back of a gorilla and cut its head off with his blade. He felt movement in the corner of his eye and swore when he saw Shikaku, Inoichi, and Choza trying to fight a hollow that had hit the roof they were standing on so hard that it cracked the concrete below it. He saw Choza punch it in the face and Shikaku hold it still. The hollow quickly broke free of the shadow control, even with their combination attack. The punch barely even scratched its mask. A second hollow landed nearby and reached out for Inoichi. Inoichi used the mind body disturbance jutsu, but the hollow didn't react and grabbed the Yamanaka clan head and squeezed him tightly. Don't interfere. Hitsugaya yelled as he fell off the cliff. The impact was so strong that ice sprayed behind him as he cut the hollow's arm like butter. Choza and Shikaku both looked at Inoichi as he fell down with a wheeze. It took Shikaku a moment to ask, Naruto? Used to be, Hitsugaya snapped, cutting through the second hole. Fall back and get out of there. Your kids told me to tell you this, do you not hear? 
you're at a disadvantage, Choza said. Hitsugaya swung his blade out again, sending another blast of ice that cut an incoming bat in half. He looked at them three with anger. No, I'm not, Hitsugaya growled. This battle is what my afterlife is all about. The living can't clean hollow like Shinigami can, and you don't know how to fight them well. Just once, pay attention to me. I don't have time to worry about babysitting you. The three of them knew Hitsugaya was right when they looked at each other. Shikaku bowed his head. You be careful. He laughed and said, I don't need to be careful. Not against these hollow. That was it. He took to the air again because he saw that while he was trying to keep the clan heads fighting away, he had let more hollows get through. Since he didn't have anyone to help him, getting to all of these damn hollows without having to do too much physical work was. Wait a minute. He had chakra once more. The henge would not have worked any other way. If not, the paper wouldn't have torn. After that, he thought about how much money he had. Hitsugaya focused on feeling the chakra that was hidden inside him while moving his hands up into the right seal as best he could while still holding a sword. He let out a growl that slowly built up until it wrapped him in a blue dome and blew around him like a wind. Yes, this would work for him. Shin no Jutsu for Taiju Cage. The village now knew who Hitsugaya was. 100 copies stood there without any trouble. Hitsugaya took a deep breath. For the first time in a long time, spreading his power out so much made him feel a little tired. Still, it was manageable, and he was confused about how he'd lived without it. Hitsugaya moved forward, driven by a strong desire to make sure that the village below would never be destroyed again. The clones spread out. As soon as Hitsugaya started his counterattack against the hollow invasion, Shikamaru acted right away. He looked at the rest of his friends with a serious face. All right. He said, we need to work. Do not get involved. Just get everyone out of there. Are you serious? Ino looked at Shikamaru and asked in shock. Are you going to do what he said? Let him fight all of those things by himself. Shino looked up at the sky and said, he seems to have it under control. The ice. Mist rain that fell below with each hollow showed how skilled Hitsugaya really was. Okay, Sakura said, her face set with determination. Ino. Let's check to see if anyone is hurt. We should make it clear that we are some of the best Irio Ninja in this village. Why? Yeah. This is what Ino said as she tensed up her shoulders and followed Sakura. The two of them looked at each other and then at the group. We'll keep an eye on the civilians who are leaving, Neji said. Hanada was glad that Neji and she both agreed with her. Hanada added, and we'll divert people as needed. Shikamaru said, go, and the two of them ran into the chaos of scared civilians and helped them get away from the hollows that were closing in. Tenten, Shino, Sai, Kiba, Lee, and Tenten quickly went after them to help. Choji looked to Shikamaru for help. What are you going to do? Shikamaru looked at Choji with a firm gaze. Everything I can to make sure the future of Konoha is protected. Choji then agreed. So will I. So, with a mission, the two went down into the chaos below to find people who were still stuck and help them get going. Of the people who were there, most were panicking, but some knew Hitsugaya's power and were hoping that Naruto would come back. Some of them even stopped in the middle of the chaos to watch the battle above. Even though Shikamaru wasn't trying to, he couldn't help but look up and watch Hitsugaya move so easily and how the ice followed his every move and did what he said. Since he knew he was going to die soon, he had some doubts about agreeing to Hitsugaya's request to be left to fight alone. But it was clear that his fighting skills had only gotten better after he died. A scream was heard. A girl. He woke up from his dream when he heard a crash. He looked around and saw a building that had been damaged. As Shikamaru moved forward, he cursed and prayed to a higher power that he would get there before anything happened. Choji was following him closely. A young woman was hiding while holding a crying child. A huge, six. Armed animal grabbed some trash and threw it away, then made its way into the destroyed building and reached out to grab her. Right away, Shikamaru broke through the seals to use his shadow imitation jutsu. He was glad he grabbed it before it could grab her. He knew right away why Hitsugaya told them not to fight the hollows. It was hard for him to hold it still for long enough, and its sheer strength made it impossible for him to keep doing it. The Shikamaru yelled, run. Choji, get them out and go. Choji said, yes, 
and then he used the partial expansion jutsu to make his hand bigger and grab the girl and the child before they could get away. Shikamaru didn't start to think about how he could get out of this until Choji left. He had to be very careful with the times. He clenched his teeth and reached into his pocket to get a kanai and an explosive tag. He dropped his jutsu and wrapped the tag around it. As the beast turned to charge at him, he threw the kanai, and as soon as it hit the mask, it went off. Shikamaru jumped off the building into the smoke from the explosion and landed on the next building with a roll. He was out of breath and felt like he had just barely gotten away. He had, for sure. The hollow hit him right behind him, making him lurch back and freeze. His eyes went wide. The mask was coming off, and there was. A face. It made Shikamaru sick. What were these? As soon as his thought left his mind, a fist wrapped around his middle. The hollow pulled him into the air with its mouth wide open. His eyes got even bigger when three more landed around it and reached out to grab him. But everything was moving too quickly for him to be able to pull out the explosive tags that were in his bag. After that, he heard it. Getsuga Tensho. And saw a white slash of energy cut through the group of hollow that was almost going to hit him but missed by a hair. Shikamaru fell on his back when the hollow that was holding him broke apart. He took a few deep breaths to calm down. He took a deep breath and looked up at the sky. There was a tall figure with orange hair wearing the same clothes that Hitsugaya liked. What the hell was that? It seemed like these things would never end. It seemed like every time Hitsugaya got rid of a batch, another giant would appear and a new batch would take its place. He was getting really annoyed by it, especially since his cage bunshins were pretty weak since he had just recently gotten his chakra back. Even so, he was in charge of the situation. He learned through some of his clone's memories that he had blown his cover and was now known for who he really was, which was not good at all. He did have other things to do, though. He had to protect the village right now. It's me, Toshiro. That better be the real you, not one of those weird clones. Hitsugaya moved his body. It's Hitsugaya. Taiko. He instinctively snapped, but he had to stop for a moment while the battle grew less intense so he could figure out what had happened. Three more clones ran away, and he was reminded of Ichigo's Getsuga Tensho, which had killed a new wave of hollows while he was focused on his own fight. What is Kurosaki? How? I've been trying to get in touch with Soul Society for a week, right? He took out a small badge from his Shiakusho and sent a Ryoku pulse into it. We thought we saw you too. What in the world happened? You made everyone scared. After that, Ichigo gave Hitsugaya a good look and couldn't hold back a small laugh. Why? Why are you wearing pajamas? Both of Hitsugaya's eyebrows went up. I'm truly moved by your care, he deadpanned. But that doesn't matter. I will cut you off if you say anything about the pajamas. Then he frowned. Though I find it hard to believe that it's just you that came to find me. Ichigo went away with a shunpo and came back to cut a hollow in half. Well, yeah, of course it's not just me, he said. I'm just the test. Hitsugaya asked with his eyes narrowed. Test? He seemed crazy to Ichigo. Do you even know where you are, Toshiro? Hitsugaya frowned and cut into another hollow. That's Hitsugaya. Taiko. The answer is yes, I do. I don't understand why I couldn't go back. Having people around who didn't look at him and see someone he wasn't again was nice. Of course, he wouldn't say that to Ichigo. The Senkaimons didn't have this dimension keyed in, or something. Ichigo took a moment to explain as he stabbed one hollow and then swung his blade through it to get Sugatensho another. What getta? Boshi said didn't make a lot of sense to me, and that creepy Kuritsuchi guy didn't help at all. Do you know? I still don't like him after seven years or so. Hitsugaya sent out another ice dragon, which landed right next to Ichigo while he looked over the battlefield again. Hum. That did make him feel a little better about not being able to connect with the afterlife properly. Anyway, Ichigo continued, lurching back as an attack was blocked by the blade, we had to make sure the Senkaimon was set up correctly, but we also didn't want to send anyone through who wasn't ready to handle themselves. To finish, Hitsugaya said, so you volunteered like the impulsive idiot you have a bad habit of being. He appeared slightly amused. There was a frustrated grin on Ichigo's face, and both his brow and lip twitched. Oi. He cut three hollow through. I know I'm strong enough to handle things on my own. Matsumoto is in charge of our plan to get you back. That's great. 
just what I needed. Masayoshi coming here to meet Lady Hokage. He was scared. In fact, he had been hoping that would never happen. He knew that someone or something was working against him. Lady Hokage. He asked Ichigo. That was all Hitsugaya could say. Let me explain later. Keep your eyes open, Kurosaki. More are coming. Sadly for him, someone else who was interested used the distraction as a chance to do something. Hitsugaya choked up and lost his balance as the Kayubi's chakra surged forward. He landed hard on the roof below and slid down to the next roof below, knocking some tiles off in the process. The blow hurt his whole body in a dull ache, but the sharp, burning edge of the cloak that was trying to take him over hurt him more. He got new teeth, rougher nails that turned into claws, and wilder whiskers. Toshiro Ichigo quickly went down and landed better next to the captain. He got on his knees and stared in shock as the dangerous red energy began to gather around Hitsugaya's body. Damn it, Hitsugaya growled and put his hand to his face, ignoring the speed with which clone memories were returning to try to block the Kyubi's influence. Screw it. Get away. I'm not going to let you. Taiko. Fuck. Hitsugaya raised his head and winced. Who were it? Rukia, Renji, Matsumoto, Hinamori, Akaku, and Yumachika. Matsumoto made a choice that I found interesting. Wait. Yurahara? He made a noise. As Yurahara waved his fan away with a smug smile, oh, don't mind me Hitsugaya. Taiko, I just came out of curiosity, this is such a cool place. Did you get born here? Hitsugaya opened his mouth to speak, but someone spoke up quickly. Naruto. When Sakura, teams 8, 9, and 10, and she arrived, she called. Are you okay? Who the hell are you guys? Akaku drew his sword and sighed. Get away from me. This has nothing to do with people. Neji snapped back, getting ready to attack, since you're invading our village, we should be asking that question first. When everything was looked at, Hitsugaya believed the defensive stances of the two groups were silly. He scowled when he saw the remnants of the horde getting too close for comfort. Enough, Hitsugaya growled. He looked over at the extra Shinigami and glared at them. Instead of antagonizing the living, would you care of the damn hollow? He was stressed out about other things. Yes, indeed. Yurahara knelt down and said, Akaku, Yumachika, take care of the last of them, would you? Akaku gave the group one more look before lowering his sword with a sneer. Yumachika let out a sigh. We'll help too, Rukia told Renji as she grabbed his arm. Renji gave her a sharp look, but when he looked back at Hitsugaya, he nodded. The four jumped away to clean up, and Yurahara put both hands on his knees. This must be the energy signature we've been picking up with your Ryatsu signature, Yurahara said as he rubbed his chin. It feels quite gloomy. Matsumoto didn't pay attention to Yurahara's thought. Instead, he looked at Hitsugaya and noticed how tense and harrowed he looked. What happened, Taiko? Her question was soft. Just to hurt you like this? Hitsugaya. Kun, you look terrible, Hinamori said softly as she got down on her knees and reached out to comfort him. The Hitsugaya hissed. His snap was, don't touch me, and Hinamori jerked back, her eyes wide. That cloak is acidic. I'm okay. Curious. Yurahara sang and smiled as he raised his fan, snapped it open, and waved it in front of his face and I know you're all very interested. It's nice to meet you all. You must be the people he grew up with. Ichigo stopped moving and blinked in shock. Really? The first thing Sakura said was, yes, but she looked a little confused by Yurahara's strange behavior. But who are you? Hitsugaya. Taiko's associate. He looked at Hitsugaya and smiled even more. But that doesn't matter, Hitsugaya. Taiko, do you remember your life? Yes. Hitsugaya replied, five years now. He sagged as the last of the cloak fell off, and his eyes went back to being blue. He took a moment to breathe and then closed his eyes. Fuck it. This is getting unpleasant. Shikamaru spoke before Matsumoto could say anything. He said, Hitsugaya, and Hitsugaya looked over tired. He frowned because he saw something scary in Shikamaru's eyes. Those hollow. Under their masks. The look on Ichigo's face changed, and Matsumoto turned away. Hitsugaya let out a sigh because he knew exactly what Shikamaru had been through. 
Ah. You did see through the mask, right? Shikamaru gave a nod. Were those things humans? They aren't human anymore, Ichigo said softly, and he looked like he was possessed. There's no coming back from being a hollow. Our job, Matsumoto said with a serious face, is to keep life and death in balance for the living. Taking care of hollows is part of this. Our Zanpakuto cleans them, which lets them into soul society, Hinamori said from where she was kneeling. Urahara looked very angry at Hitsugaya and said, I see you've been holding back information. Considering that I suspect you're going to be sticking around, you should really be forthwith with what you know, Hitsugaya. Taiko. What? Matsumoto looked straight at Hitsugaya and asked in a sharp voice. It was all Hitsugaya could do to sigh and hang his head. I'll explain why I think that way, but Urahara is right. I will stay here until I take care of my business. You're staying? Lee asked with a hopeful look on his face. Hirosugaya got up and brushed off his pajamas. He then huffed at them as he did so. Until I understand how to stop Edo Tensai from trying to bring me back here. Yes, I plan to stay. Hitsugaya wasn't sure what to think about what was going to happen next because Lee's eyes were so bright. He avoided Lee's first attempt to hug him, but Lee wasn't scared and was able to grab him on the second try. Oi. Hi, Naruto. You are back with us and we'll stay. We all need to catch up on a lot of things. Urahara spoke up and caught Lee's attention. Ah, I don't mean to be rude and cut things short here, she said. Hitsugaya used the chance to pull away and wipe himself down with a grumble. But we do need to establish a point of contact with Seiradi as per our orders. He smiled and looked at Hitsugaya as he waved his fan. Do you happen to have a place in mind for where we can do this? Hitsugaya made a noise. It was going to be really crowded in his apartment. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.